Uh, and Jack Cheesebro, Jack is Frank's brother and Harry's uncle, uh, and another gentleman clearing land for pineapples in about 1904. So Boca Raton, uh, like many other South Florida communities, was a big pineapple town. They called them pines back then. Uh, and you can see the pineapples growing on Frank's property, which was um, southeast Boca Raton, south of Camino Real, east of Dixie. That's his house and barn. And we know in 1908, there was a pineapple blight that destroyed the, uh, much of the Florida crop. And at that point, the Cuban market took over the pineapple market. However, that doesn't mean that the locals ceased to grow pineapples, apparently, because I have photos such as the little one in set at the lower left showing my pioneer um, Imogene Alice Gates and her brother Buddy in a pineapple field. And Imogene was born in 1916. So this is after 1920 and people are still growing pines. It's just not the major crop it had once been. <laughs> I love this photo. Now, I, I want you to know I spent a lot of time in Photoshop trying to fix this. Um, however, the quality of the image isn't great, but the subject is wonderful. Look at the size of those pineapples. We also grew Irish potatoes, white potatoes, as you can see, bananas, citrus. And interestingly, um, we, we think of Central Florida as citrus country. But in those early days, um, South Florida was known for its citrus. It was thought of as being below the frost line, and for the most part, it is. So oranges, grapefruit, and so on. This is Mr. Cheesebro's citrus grove. Mangoes were kind of a new, trendy, exotic fruit, and people were beginning to experiment with the different varieties. <laughs> This is one of our favorite postcards. It says a bunch of northern suckers and people are sucking on coconuts. Now, many of you heard the story that the um, ship Providencia landed on Palm Beach, I think it's 1878. And part of their cargo was coconuts. And that's how the coconuts came to Palm Beach and how Palm Beach got her name. However, these were not the first coconuts. Coconuts are not a native species, by the way. Uh, this is not how the first coconuts came to South Florida. In fact, um, coconuts are often considered a naturalized tree. That means they float here on the ocean and then come up the waterways and then grow along our natural waterways. But also, I know that the um, Lewis family in Fort Lauderdale um, had planted coconuts as early as the 1790s. And that's probably true along the Miami River as well. So there's more than one source for our, the origin of coconut palms in Southeast Florida. This is really interesting. Uh, it's a diagram from Tom Rickard's survey books, probably from before 1900. And it's a diagram of his experimental grove on Sunset Hill. Now Sunset Hill is the, where our cemetery is today. Isn't that just perfect? And you can see he is growing tangerines, oranges, pineapples, kumquats, Brazil, and Suriname cherries. Now, Suriname cherries are what us kids call Florida cherries. And in my lifetime, that was always a landscaping plant. My dad has a hedge outside his house. The, the uh, fruits are about the size of a cherry. They have a stone like a cherry, and they're shaped like little pumpkins. And when they're really red, they're ripe and almost edible. Uh, I had no idea that they were cultivated for the fruits. They're supposedly real high in antioxidants, but there you go, growing them as for their fruit early, very early on. Now, this is a list that we gleaned from Mr. Cheesebro's early diaries. And I want you to bear with me because I am going to read this list. It's very impressive. Pineapples, mangoes, ever-bearing peas, oranges, limes, loquats, which is similar to a kumquat, guavas, Suriname cherries, potatoes, marrow fat peas. Now they're harvested dry. And the modern usage is they're used to make wasabi 
peas. Isn't that interesting? Cabbage, grapefruit, tomatoes, watermelon, sweet potato, Florida header, a feed crop, turnips, eggplants, onions, mustard greens, wax beans, strawberries, peanuts, dwarf tomatoes, lettuce, cucumbers, bananas, sugarcane, anonas, which is a tropical custard fruit, peppers, sweet corn, velvet bean to improve the soil. And <laughs> it happens to be uh, an aphrodisiac, supposedly. Avocados, mulgobas, which are mangoes, cow peas, beggar weed for the soil. Hasapalum, is, which is a feed grain, pearl millet, feed grain, cotton, which you certainly don't eat, natal plum for preserves, paragrass for forage, carissas, which are a plum shaped fruit, red cabbage, cassava, which is manioc, like poi is made out of, pole beans, Mexican yam beans, which are a tuber, and rice. Now, not all of these crops were probably successful, but he experimented with all of them. Now, interestingly, uh, our early pioneers, particularly in the 19th century, down here in South Florida, did not believe they could sustain livestock because the mosquitoes were so bad they would suffocate the cows uh, and the ticks and mites were so bad they would kill the poultry and fowl. Uh, and so our early pioneers relied on canned milk, which either came by train or before that by boat, and sea turtle eggs, which were very plentiful, of course, in the summertime. And so summertime was baking season originally. Uh, there's a very good account of this in a book called Letters from Linton, which um, you can used to be able to get at the Delray Historical Society. Linton is Delray Beach, uh, and it is the um, actual letters from early Delray Beach pioneers and how they survived on things like canned milk and turtle eggs. So slowly but surely, some brave souls uh, managed to bring in livestock. Um, as we drained the soil, as we built farms and irrigation ditches and um, roads and buildings, uh, slowly but surely, a lot of the land dried up and it was possible to have livestock in South Florida. In fact, both uh, Broward County uh, by 1950 was the second largest dairy county in the state and the 10th largest in the U.S. And I'm sure Palm Beach County could not have been far behind because it's a geographically very large county. Now, so here we have uh, Mr. Cheesebro's Jersey cow, and you see he is so famous he has his own postcard. So that was hot stuff. Uh, Cheesebro also kept bees and he sold honey, goats, horses, mule that did all the really hard work, and chickens, and he did sell chicken eggs. This is a, um, some of the little Imogene's uh, memor memories of the pests in the good old days. Uh, we have poor Harley, her dad, with his palmetto fan trying to fend off the swarms in June, July, and August. That when it would be really bad. Imogene and Grandma Davis are picking huckleberries, which I understand are wild blueberries. And Grandma Davis has paper stuck in her stockings to fend off the little biting, jumping things, uh, not to mention the brambles and the soft palmetto. And of course, poor Imogene's trying to get to sleep at her house there where the wildflower property is today with all the uh, buzzing and, and hissing and hooting and whining and grumping of the alligators. Uh, it was like trying to sleep in the Okefenokee Swamp. So I don't know about you, but I can suffer through heat and humidity a lot better than I do bugs. Uh, and they were pretty horrible in those days, both for agriculture and just for everybody. So number one on the hit parade was sand flies or snow seams. And they're little tiny gnats. Uh, and they were so small, they would come through the screens of the pioneers. And, and pioneers here did have screens. It was the 20th century. So what they would do was they would take kerosene or crank case oil and paint their screens. And so the sand flies would stick on there like flies on flypaper until it was so thick you couldn't see out the screen. And then you took it down and washed it off and started all over again. Now this was primarily in the summer month. 
However, you can imagine your choices are being eaten alive or your house smells like kerosene all the time. I wonder how that impacted people's lifespan. Anyway, we also had caterpillars, cutworms, mosquitoes, of course, rats, rattlesnakes. They were everywhere back in the old days. This is rattlesnake country. Rabbits and um, how they got to the oranges and grapefruit, I'm not quite sure. Grasshoppers, worms, flies, raccoons, and orange tree scale. And I like to mention that uh, these early farmers um, in, in Boca Raton, they weren't what we would call organic or natural farmers. None of this, the one with nature uh, in agriculture. No, no, no. They took advantage of every chemical that they had at hand. Uh, Mr. Cheesebro would use Paris Green, which is the inorganic compound copper sulfate. Very, very effective pesticide, but unfortunately it's very effective. It kills all kinds of things. Uh, and he used fertilizers and soil amendments. We had several packing houses, and these would be right near the railroad tracks. Uh, this is Mr. Long was the first packing house, and those folks are packing tomatoes. So at tomato harvest time, everybody would show up so you could quickly pack and ship the tomatoes so they wouldn't um, rot before you could send them away. Mr. Cheesebro had a two-story packing house. Now, I like to mention invasive species. This is something of great interest to me. Uh, it's early 20th century when we start introducing them to Florida. We know that um, Mr. Cheesebro planted Australian pines, which are not a native, um, as early as 1915. These are the Australians along East Palmetto Park Road. Uh, here they are. You can see the wispy trees behind the workers are Australians, and in the background we have our native pines. I know they were planted along Dixie Highway, um, not necessarily continuously, but in spots, and they were planted as windbreaks, as well as a way to um, suck up the excess, excess moisture in the soil, so sort of for drainage purposes. How'd you get around? Well, by horse and buggy, of course. This is Bert and Annie Rollerson at the Cheesebro Homestead very early on. And of course, the train. But the train wasn't really a commuter line. Um, this was for serious travel. Maybe if you're going to Miami um, or Jacksonville or you know, points north. Uh, that This picture, it shows our Florida East Coast Railway Freight Depot. Uh, and it stood north of Palmetto Park Road, just to the east of the tracks. So what today would be west of Dixie Highway, between the tracks and Dixie Highway. Uh, and that served as our only train station for many years. So this is absolutely um, my favorite entry in all of Mr. Cheesebro's diary. August 27, 1909 to Miami in morn and back on wheel. Left at 11.30, in Deerfield at five. Heard him unloaded rest of lumber and scuffled. Saw lawyer price for Jackson. Now, then as now, one does not go to Miami unless one absolutely has to. So probably to see an attorney as in this case or see a dentist or something really important. Uh, we believe that Mr. Cheesebro went down by train and took his bicycle with him and rode back. And I do have um, a couple of other incidences, uh, memories of pioneers where they would do make, um, travel in this way. Uh, possibly, I don't know what the train route was then. It's quite possible it was, you know, there was a northbound train one day and a southbound train the next. Anyway, whatever the case, the schedule did not meet Mr. Cheesebro's needs. So he felt that it was necessary to bicycle back. 11.30 to Deerfield at 5. It's 45 miles from Boga to Miami. I'm, I'm really impressed with that because it's not like the roads were had asphalt on them or anything. They were, you know, sand and so on. Uh, plus, at the time, Mr. Cheesebro is 58, and it's August 27th. Now, just a comment about that. We believe it's was actually a little cooler back in those days in 1909. 
Um, not a lot, but because uh, number one, we didn't have any condos blocking the breeze on the beach. We didn't have all the asphalt and concrete that we have to build up heat in an urban area as we do today. Uh, so it may have been, you know, 87 instead of 90, but nonetheless, it was August 27. Very impressive feat for Mr. Cheesebro. So George Long gets the first automobile in town in 1912, and Mr. Cheesebro gets his in 1914. Uh, and here we can see that freight depot I mentioned, uh, and Mr. C's car um, acting as a school bus. I want to talk about the bridges a minute. Uh, this is a bridge over the Hillsborough River, now the El Rio Canal, roughly at Northwest 20th Street. So you think of the en eastern entrance to FAU, um, that's at 20th Street, um, and you head west. If you and when you're on campus, to the right would be the president's house, and in front of you would be the administration building. So back then, it was still the Hillsborough River. Um, and there was very good muck in that area, which is great for growing vegetables. So people harvested the muck, but there were also probably a few farms right on the banks of the canal there. This photo was taken in 1905. Now, this is not the same bridge. Very similar picture, isn't it? Uh, this is actually the bridge over another part of the Hillsborough River, the part that's now the Hillsborough Canal. Uh, roughly where the Dixie Highway flyover stimulus bridge is into Deerfield, uh, roughly in that vicinity. And so we know there was a bridge there as early as 1892. This photo supposedly taken in 1907. And interestingly, I have a number of pictures that purport to be this bridge, uh, and they may be in fact in the same location, but the structures of the bridge are clearly not the same structure. Um, and so there's a few reasons that could be possible. Um, one is, of course, it's a little old wooden bridge, uh, probably no, not treated lumber or anything like that. Uh, and with, they probably wore out uh, from dry rot and termites and who knows what uh, within a couple of years had to be replaced frequently. Um, unfortunately, the larger photo, we don't know which direction we're looking. Um, is the guy northbound or is he southbound? Are we looking to Deerfield or is that Boca in the distance? So most importantly of all, we finally got a bridge over the intercoastal, then the Florida East Coast Canal in 1917. And before this, to go to the beach, you had to take a boat. Uh, and so the Palmetto Park Road Bridge opened in 17. The Board of Trade, which is like a chamber of commerce, um, got the county to build our bridge. And uh, the larger view here is looking east. Now, remember that little bridge, that would have been much, much smaller than our current span because the current span we have um, has a much uh, longer approach, both on the beach side and on the inland side because it's a much higher bridge. Uh, and it probably was a turn bridge. That means it pivoted in the center. So in the distance there, um, on the left is the wildflower property, the Palmetto Park Plantation. Uh, and on the right is Silver Palm Park. In those days, the Gorton's house. And then the insets show the bridge looking west from the east side. And we have uh, Mrs. Townsend there. Um, she was the bridge tender's wife and also um, Charlie Rollerson's sister, Eliza. Uh, and then we have a later bridge tender, uh, Mr. Lucas Douglas, another pioneer family. I believe both of those views are looking west to judge from the trees in the background. You, of course, could get around by on the intercoastal. I want to mention a little bit about our inlet. Boca Raton Inlet is a natural inlet, but we know from most historic maps that it appeared to have been closed or silted over throughout the 18th, 19th, and early 20th century, um, early 20th centuries. Uh, and you can see on this 1900 map, it is not navigable at this point. Um, but we know again from Cheese Bros diaries that the pioneers would go out uh, and periodically dredge out the inlet, so it was navigable. 
Uh, on one occasion, they spent hours doing the digging by hand um, and took a break for lunch and went back. And of course, it's silted over already. Um, but by, by about 1915, they were able to maintain an open inlet. Uh, now, I wanted to talk about, I'm going to talk about the Hillsborough River, um, aka Canal and the El Rio. Back up. Um, and I wanted to show you this modern map so you can kind of see where we're looking. Today, folks, right here, this is what we call the El Rio Canal. But originally, this, can you see my cursor going down here? Here's the loop. Okay, here, that's the Hillsborough River, or used to be. Uh, and so this north-south portion became the El Rio Canal. And what happened was this waterway here is the Hillsborough Canal, which was, and now all of this is Hillsborough Canal, and this, of course, is the intercoastal, and then it, the outlet is at the Hillsborough Inlet. So in uh, 1911, the Hillsborough Canal, which goes to Lake Okeechobee, began construction. Now, the Hillsborough is part of a project started in the early 20th century um, to drain the Everglades to make good farmland. And one of the principal proponents of that was Governor Napoleon Bonaparte Brower, and he had state backing on that. It was a project that was almost universally embraced. The first of, of the drainage canals was the North New River Canal off the South Fork of New River in Fort Lauderdale. And that began in 1906, completed in 1912. So the North New River Canal, South New River Canal, Miami River Canal, Hillsborough Canal, Palm Beach Canal were all part of this great project to both drain the Everglades and uh, create transport canals. Uh, so by the late teens, it was possible for people around the Lake Okeechobee area to barge their produce down the Hillsborough Canal to the railhead at Deerfield to be packed and shipped north. Um, unfortunately, the canals were not very well built. Uh, they didn't take out a lot of the large boulders. They, they didn't remain navigable for very long. They also silted over due to agricultural runoff. Um, however, and it's, it, this is in its glory day. So that's how the Hillsborough Canal came to be. So here we have our view of Palmetto Park Road once again. Looking east, you can see some of the tourist cottages over there on the left. Um, I had to show one of my favorite pictures of little Carl Douglas, one of our pioneers, uh, in 1922. And Carl um, is no longer with us, but he had an excellent memory from the olden days. So we learned a great deal about our um, uh, days. As he said, he couldn't remember anything after IBM arrived, uh, but, <laughs> but he was really good at anything before that. So here's a fascinating view of Palmetto Park Road looking west. And I believe this is taken from east of Federal, which did not exist yet. You can see a tourist cottage or two there. Um, and probably the train tracks are in the distance, but remember they have a low profile. Uh, and so either this photo was taken before the Australian pines were put in, or the pines are behind the photographer. That's a possibility too. Now those po poles, I believe, are phone poles. We didn't have uh, electrical power lines until 2526 when FPL was new, but we did have phones early on. I know the gates had a telephone. So I believe those are telephone poles. Well, very exciting in 1915, Dixie Highway comes to town. Uh, and Dixie Highway um, still exists technically. It's a series of interconnected local roads that connect Miami with Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan. And there's actually an east and a west route. So the part through Boca had to be built for the most part. Uh, this was our first interstate. <laughs> so this was exciting. You could get down south here uh, via automobile, which of course was slowly but surely taking over the railroad as principal transport. Uh, and so you can see um, our Dixie Highway Welcoming Committee. The occasion was there was a motorcade from um, Delray Beach to Fort Lauderdale 
to celebrate the opening of the highway. Uh, and so these gentlemen are there to welcome the motorcade. Uh, and you notice the banner spells Boca Raton, no E this time. Uh, and it doesn't say, hey, we have beautiful beaches or great parks. It says our seeds are sown because agriculture is still very important. Now, Dixie through downtown Boca in those days was actually on the west side of the tracks. Um, and so you would be, if you were coming south, you'd be on the east side, jump over to the west side of the tracks, somewhere north of Palmetto Park Road, head down to where the little um, singing pines used to be uh, at about southeast third. Uh, and then go over the tracks once again and continue on the east side. You can see the diagram there. And every uh, town on the Dixie would have a sign like this big one in this photograph that showed the local route. And as a matter of fact, this view is looking north and those buildings um, on the right there, they would today be smack dab in the middle of Dixie Highway. So very shortly after this, the entire highway through Boca Raton was moved to the east side. Uh, our first school was in 1908 when we were still Dade County. Um, and um, the school board sent the lumber and Mr. Cheesebro's guys had to build the little building. It's kind of a handsome building. And it stood about where the police department headquarters is today. This is the path to the school, if you can imagine that. Um, one of our um, earliest teachers here is Mr. Lawrence Gould. We love this picture because it's a candid shot and obviously the kids are having a, a fun time having their picture taken. So the young man in the white shirt at back, that's Lawrence Gould. Uh, Gould came in 1914. He was from Michigan, so he knew the Cheesebro family. And uh, he came um, to make money so he could go to college. So he later became a geologist and a very famous polar explorer. He was um, Admiral Byrd's second in command on the Antarctic expedition of 1928. He also was in the Arctic. He became a uh, college president and lived to quite a nice old age, uh, always remembering his Boca Raton friends. And he generously donated some of his papers and wonderful photographs he took when he was here about 75 of them. Uh, and the, um, they were good for two reasons. Number one, um, he was a pretty good photographer. And believe me, most of my pioneers were not. Um, but we know exactly when the pictures were taken. And most, most photos in our collection uh, did not come with a date unless they're from the newspaper or something like that. So we know his pictures were taken between 1914 and 1960, making them very valuable indeed. Uh, this is Lawrence cranking up the school bus, as I said. Now, there was a school at Yamato for a few years, from 1917 until 22. It included white students as well as Japanese Americans. And the teacher is uh, Clementine Brown, who was um, a longtime Boca elementary teacher as well. Now, the um, African-American schools um, didn't start until 1920. Alex Hughes went to the school board and campaigned for uh, a schoolhouse. And um, the uh, what happened was at the time, 1920, the white school uh, was replaced with a masonry school. So Mr. Cheesebro took the old schoolhouse and rolled it up Dixie Highway to Pearl City to serve as a school for the African-American children. In 28, the, the hurricane kind of took out that old building. But in that year, Boca Raton was a recipient of what's called a, Rod a Rosenwald School. Uh, this was a philanthropic program to bring school buildings to um, African-American children in the rural South. So Boca was a lucky recipient of a Rosenwald School. The building to the right is the Rosenwald School plus additions, as you can see, um, and the picture to the left, um, it became known as Roadman Elementary in the 1950s, named after a city council member who had been a great benefactor of the school. And it was phased out in 65 with desegregation. 
businesses included just a couple of little general stores. This is beautiful downtown Boca in the 19 teens. Ocean Beach, that would be the Palmetto Park Road. Uh, and this is Tony Brank and Maurice Stokes store, which was on where Northwest First Avenue is today, just west of the tracks. And you can see he has a gas pump um, and it was a post office um, and supposedly um, the first phone was in this store. And we actually have that phone in our collection. So what did we do for fun? Well, uh, of course, we enjoyed the beaches, particularly in the summertime. This is the Myricks and Peg Young on the beach. Isn't that just a wonderful picture? And back then they had these horrible knit woolen bathing suits that just sort of melted off of you and allowed sand to get in every square inch of your poor little body. Uh, but they didn't seem to care. They seemed to be enjoying themselves. You could enjoy a nice boat ride on the canal. Uh, this is Nettie Cheeseboro on the Hillsboro River, maybe going for a little fishing or just a little boating. You could go turtling in the summertime, and people certainly did. Not only did they collect eggs, but of course, they harvested the turtle meat, which feeds a lot of people and helps supplement a lot of larders. Fishing was supposedly awesome. Uh, this is a fish camp uh, gas station dance hall called Boca Raton by the Sea, which stood about where the beach club is today. I think it's hilarious. Boca Raton by the Sea with an E. Uh, and here we have the Kennys when the bluefish are running. Uh, and they used to be so um, populous that they would jump in the boat. It was You can't really call it fishing. People would get in boats and go down the intercoastal to the Hillsboro Lighthouse for an all-day picnic. And you can see here's the Myricks and the Youngs and a couple of Cheeseboro gals and Warren School uh, obviously having a really nice day at the Hillsboro Light. The lighthouse is visible uh, in the background at left and that's the keeper's cottage to the right. Uh, and according to Lawrence, they had something called a tacky party, which apparently involved dressing up in whatever silly outfit you could find. And of course, you could always take a break in the proverbial shack by the canal, which Frank Cheeseboro likes to talk about all the time. Well, all of this is going to change in the 1920s um, with the coming of the Florida land boom and Addison Meisner. The world is going to change radically for Boca Raton. So one of our new History Alive galleries is going to be dedicated to the pioneer era. So I think that's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to feature a uh, classroom space for our um, school age children. And you can see there on the left, that's going to be an interactive station um, that is a, the um, um, engine, the cab of a steam engine. Um, so there will be a lot of great activities for youngsters and oldsters as well. So we want to thank you for joining us today. Um, next Thursday, we're going to take up the issue of the Florida land boom, Boca Raton, and Addison Meisner.